Time to get spicy. I brought you to the outskirts of Singapore into a very nice nursery, as you can see, to talk about a very cool little plant with one of the most amazing little fruits that completely changed world history. What are we talking about? Of course, we're talking about this cute little thing called the chili. Let's have a chat. In most cultures around the world, we take the chili for granted, as if this was part of their cuisine and culture forever and ever. But that is not so. The story of how chili became a part of our life and eating culture starts on the 29th of May, 1453. What happened? A guy called Sultan Mehmed II conquers a place called Constantinople. Constantinople, of course, was the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, which had been founded by Constantine. Why is that so important to the story? Because up to the moment that Constantinople was conquered by the Turkic people and turned into Istanbul, this was the major gateway for all the spices and silks to come from the east to the west. And once the Turks had conquered the territory, they did one very smart thing, they thought. They increased the taxes on all the luxury goods and items, including spices. But what that meant is that it became not lucrative to trade them anymore because they were too expensive. That brought the whole trade in spices down. One of the hottest hit places by this change was Venice, La Serenissima. They had profited enormously from all that trade in spices and silks. But what was the problem? It was almost a case of poetic justice because Venice had been competing with Constantinople over hundreds of years. And in 1204, they even in attacked and invaded Constantinople. So when you go to Venice nowadays and you can see these four famous golden bronze horses, the Quadriga, in the main square of St. Marcus, they came from Constantinople from the Hippodrome where the Venetians stole them or took them away as loot of war. Now what happened is because of these attacks, they had weakened Constantinople to a point where the Turks could actually take them over. And with that, the Turks were able to strangle the whole trade route and that also meant that Venice started its decline. Poetic justice. As the lights went down over the economical future of Venice, the historical focus shifts away from the Mediterranean to the West, to two places that had been literally at the fringes of the map and of history. Portugal and Spain. At that point, they had nothing much going for them, but because of this closure of the Silk Route, they had one huge advantage. Look at the map. They were right there where the Atlantic Ocean starts. And this is where Portugal and Spain said, wait a second, the spices aren't coming from there anymore, from Venice, but we have the sea routes. Maybe we can go and find the spices. Now, why were spices so fantastically expensive? They came from very far-flung places, from India all the way into the Spice Islands of Indonesia. And because they were so far away, a lot of mythology had ranked around them, like, for example, the pepper plants were guided by venomous serpents. or that cinnamon was harvested from nests of some mythical fantastic birds. Of course, complete gobbledygook, but that added to the mystique and the price. And what were they used for? Yes, partially for curing meats, but also for oils, medicines, even for anti-plague medicines. And it was also something for the rich to show status. This is what made it so well worthwhile for Spain and Portugal to go out there and look for new sea lanes to reach the fabled spice islands and the spice areas of the world. And the two, two different courses. Portugal decided to go south around Africa to nose their way and find their way to the east. And the Spaniards found a guy called Columbus, or Columbus better said, found them. The idea of the Portuguese was fairly simple and straightforward. If we go down south far enough, hopefully there will at some point be an end to this thing called Africa. We can go around it and go east into Asia. When Columbus came along, he shopped around an idea saying, nah, let's go to the west and we're gonna find Asia faster. What was the problem? The question was, everybody knew that the world was round, but Columbus, being self-educated, had made some massive miscalculations. And in his miscalculations, 
Actually, he thought that Asia was over 10,000 kilometers closer to Europe than it actually was and most scientists of the time knew that. Don't! And this is why Columbus was bounced around from court to court to court and everybody said, don't touch this guy, he is a little bit off kilter, his numbers don't work out. Get the hell out! Get out! Get out! But in the end, he came back to Spain and offered it again to the kings Isabella and Fernando Ferdinand of Spain. And they said, you know what? What the heck? Let's put in some seed money. Like right now, you put money into a startup with the faint hope that something might come out of it. Off he went. And he sailed with La Niña, La Pinta y La Santa Maria. And what he discovered, as we all know, was not India. Where he had actually landed was the island of Hispaniola, today Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And when he met the local indigenous people, they offered him something called ají. And he said that everybody eats it copiously and it keeps them very healthy. And that is their pepper. Why pepper? because that was the only taste reference he had. And this is how today we even call bell pepper, pepperoncino, all that is called peppers because he had no other taste reference but call that pepper. So he went like, hooray, I must be here. It must be the Indies because this is spicy and hot. Went back to Spain, went like, hi guys, I'm back and I brought you the Indian pepper. And people were like, Neh not very good because for them it was way too hot and spicy. Number one. Number two, what happened was this, that those seeds grew very easily. So it became very generic. You could plant it anywhere. And with that, the mystique and the cachet was gone. People were like, eh, it is a poor man's spice. And they still wanted to have the real pepper and the real spices. So in a strange way, it was a complete flop, mm -hmm. even though he brought some spices back. And this is where the story gets really interesting. It's sort of a circular story because actually Europe had discovered Chile for the world. They themselves didn't care about it, but one guy called Vasco da Gama took it along on his sailing journey around Africa and he finally reached India in 1498 and guess what he had on board chili seeds so the funny thing is that he actually brought spices on a journey to find the spices loaded his ships with pepper made of fortune and left the indians with the chilies and they became an overnight instant success and while europe stayed bland in the cuisine the rest of the world spiced up what happened was that through india and the trade roads into afghanistan and china it even reached nepal and then from china into turkey and the turks brought it into hungary where the famous goulash started off that spicy meaty broth it took almost 500 years for chili to come full circle back to europe and spice them up and how did that happen well with international travel and also international cultural exchange because people were now accessing europe with the end of the colonies many people from india or africa moved for example to england and brought their palates and spices along and as people started traveling to thailand or mexico they wanted more of the good hot stuff. 500 years full circle of the history from Europe back to Europe. It's time to talk about the origins of Chile itself. As far as we know, they were being planted already 7,500 years ago in northern Mexico. And it seems to be the oldest crop that has ever been planted by people in the Americas and it moved very rapidly even down south to Peru and Bolivia. So in Peru in the old ceramics you can still see representations of chilies. And what makes chili so hot? A thing called capsaicin. You can actually measure the hotness of chili with something called the Scoville scale. Of course, it's also become a bit of a sport to see how hot you can handle it in many countries by now, you know, how much chili can you eat and what is the hottest chili. But that's not all. Of course, chili has spawned a bewildering variety of sub chilies and some of them are even more expensive than silver by kilogram. I present to you the Charapita from Peru. This, this is, is not okay. This needs to stop now. And to wrap it all up, here is the quiz. Which one is the hottest chili currently available in the market on the Scoville scale? World champion hottest chili. Whoever answers it correctly in the comments below in the YouTube channel gets the Firewalker t-shirt. Don't forget to like, subscribe and share.